Anyone familiar with the pioneering work done by Norfolk Study Group No. 1 has probably shared the common puzzlement over the elusive Halalial question. A real stumper at the time, it was only partially resolved when the group declined the offer of Halalial's spiritual guidance. There was only one abstention. However, one member of the group left after the initial Halalial encounter. Yet another, who had persisted with questions after the decision was made, later dropped out. Both were replaced, keeping the group's regular membership at 12. Today, aided by hindsight and the advantage offered by an overview of all the pertinent treatings touching upon the matter, both before and after the event, perhaps it is worth a fresh look at the exceedingly complex Halalial issue. We may be able to settle certain unresolved aspects of the case without in any way impugning Halalial's demonstrated merits as a spiritual guide and teacher on the one hand or the integrity of the study group on the other. Led by Edgar Cayce himself, that dedicated group of seekers was responsible for giving us the 24 Search for God study lessons. These represented the cooperative results of their own soul growth over an 11-year period from 1931 to 1942. It was in October 1933 that Halaliel's name first cropped up during reading 262-56 in the Search for God series. That reading had consisted of a brilliant summation of the group's 14th lesson, Day and Night. Symbolically significant, the subject matter was unusually profound, demanding deep concentration on the part of the listeners. Yet its presentation occurred in a psychic discourse remarkable for its clarity. The reading then closed with some information. Come, my children. Ye no doubt have gained from the comment this day that a new initiate has spoken in or through this channel. Halalial, that was with those in the beginning who warred with those that separated themselves and became as naught. Three months later, in reading 262.57 on day and night, the following question was put to their psychic source. Who is Halalial? The answer. One in and with whose courts Ariel fought when there was the rebellion in heaven. Now, where is heaven? Where is Ariel, and who was he? A companion of Lucifer or Satan, and one that made for the disputing of the influences in the experience of Adam in the garden. A most interesting reply. Clearly, as one of the heavenly combatants against the forces of darkness and separation before the material universe came into being, Halaliel was an initiate well chosen to address the group on the subject, day and night. Thus, when Halaliel's services as their future guide and teacher were offered to the group on September 9, 1934, effective with reading 26271, there might well have been instant agreement instead of hesitation. However, in the intervening months there had been some sobering developments. First, there had been a mental and spiritual reading in January 8, 1934, for a well-known socialite and theosophist, Mrs. 443, during which it had been revealed to her, at a request, that the information given. Much of it relating to the entity's association with the Hindu avatar, Krishnamurti had come from the universal forces and has emanated through the teacher that gives same. Halalial. This was enough to make those around KC, and presumably KC himself, somewhat uneasy and circumspect, as Halalial's uninvited role in the work appeared to be expanding. A week or so later, in the New York home of Mrs. 443 and her husband, during the course of World Affairs reading 3976-15, which stands out as one of the most significant in that remarkable series of prophetic readings, we again come across Halalial's authoritative voice. His contribution, apparently limited to only a portion of that rather lengthy reading, closed with these stern words. The weakling, the unsteady, must enter into the crucible and become as naught, even as he, that they may know the way. I, Halalial, have spoken. However true that statement was in essence, I think we might agree that its tone and style carried a dark, minatory ring, wholly alien to the spirit of the Christ. It was almost as if a lord of karma might have spoken. Which could, in fact, define Halalial's appointed role in the angelic hierarchy. 
nor was that the last of Halaliel's unexpected appearances. In February, 1934, KC gave a reading for the noted British medium, Eileen Garrett, who posed the question, what entity is giving this information now? The sleeping KC's reply. Being directed, as has been indicated, from the records through Halaliel. That same afternoon, Garrett let her psychic control, Yuvani, identified as an Arab adept dwelling on the fifth plane, answer questions about KC and his modus operandi. Yuvani acknowledged that KC's unusual psychic abilities depended upon a high level of development in prior incarnations. And rather than being a mediumistic psychic, like Garrett, whose psychically inspired utterances were always through a control, Yuvani explained that KC was capable of using his full etheric leverage, actually passing into the etheric state when giving a reading, so that he was, as it were, outside of his body. He was also drawing upon his own spiritual light in assisting others, Yuvani continued, thus giving you something of his own life. This is what happens. Yet Yuvani went on to suggest that KC would be able to conserve his spiritual energies, as well as give readings of greater verbal clarity, if he would turn over more of the work to a control or initiate at the same level as Yuvani himself on the other side. The next day, to test Yuvani's suggestion, reading 254.71 was given. The response, in the form of a rhetorical question, was unequivocal. Does Yuvani claim to know better than the master who made him? The reading went on to identify KC's work as that of the master of masters. And, while there may be sought others that may aid, the reading added that the master, the Christ, is sufficient unto every soul let him send whom he would for the development, but had he, the master, sent Halaliel to them in just that capacity? That cogent question somehow was not asked. However, there is more than a hint to support such a speculation in reading 262.71, which will be quoted shortly. Nonetheless, one is made to wonder otherwise. For in reading 254.83, given on February 14, 1935, long after Halaliel's proffered services had been rejected, one finds Halaliel further described as a leader of the heavenly host, who has defied Ariel, who has made the ways that have been heavy, but as the means for the understanding. Understanding at a heavy price? It strikes an ominous note. All the same, one might conceivably conclude from the foregoing that Halaliel, appearing to the group when he did, could have acted at the master's direction, precisely because they were then going through a karmic phase that called for a hard taskmaster. Unless it could be otherwise met. For, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and purgeth every one. At any rate, there is some disturbing evidence in the readings, largely in footnotes appended by KC's secretary, Gladys Davis, but also in individual messages to the group members in certain readings, to support such a theory. Specifically involved. The entities 69 and 295, who left, and Miss 993. Although a life reading had revealed to Miss 993 that she had been among the holy women in the days of Jesus, her initial resentment toward Mary Magdalene, currently identified as Miss 295, had created stumbling blocks for both. Later, in a reaction first against Paul and then against Lucius, now Edgar Casey, 993 had been the source of some of the divisiveness that had nearly caused the breaking up of the Laodicean flock over which Lucius presided as bishop. Now, in a karmic carryover, she chose to differ with the group about Halaliel, feeling that he should have been accepted as their teacher. As for Miss 295, KC told her that immediately after waking up from the reading 262-62, he saw the master and Satan contending for the mastery of her soul. She was warned against self-condemnation and negative thoughts. Mrs. 69, who had been with Casey in several prior lifetimes, not always with a favorable outcome, was similarly afflicted with a faltering outlook, presumably karmic in origin. A hindrance to spiritual progress, in time it caused her to break away. Halaliel's initial arrival on the scene, rousing new uncertainties, may have provided the impetus for her departure. 
Another appearance of Halaliel occurred in a special reading on soul communication, given on July 17, 1934, where we find him announcing his presence in a brief message, elucidating what had happened in relation to a journey being taken to other realms by Edgar Cayce's mother, then on the other side. A helpful message, allowing of no controversial interpretation, it can be passed over. Meanwhile, the pivotal reading in any attempt to come to grips with the Halaliel question is, of course, that one given on September 9, 1934, 26271. The following excerpts from that reading are essential to understand the matter in all of its ramifications. Look in upon the experiences, for, as will be seen, my children, there has been appointed one Halaliel that may aid thee in thy future lessons, and he will be thy teacher, thy guide, one sent through the power of thine own desires. Thine own selves, then, may prevent his being, meeting, living, dwelling with thee. Not the Christ, but his messenger, with the Christ from the beginning, and is to other worlds what the Christ is to this earth. As many of you ask now, why should the realm of spirit be mindful of this group, of the work of these gathered here? The sincerity of thy purpose has merited, has destined, that such can be thy experience. What, then, ye ask, is the way, the manner? That no one mention who, though the name and the activities of any desire may be given thee, but when thou speakest outside. Thine own group, thou hast cut thyself aloof. 26277, months later, explains. Ye have not chosen. Then, remember Lot's wife. Ye chose not for a dweller among thee save in the spirit of the Christ. It is as he gave when he brought that which separated the physical body from the possession of that which brought ill, or dissension. What was his command? See that thou tellest no man. Tell God, from within. Live it from without. Reading 26271 continues, Art thou willing to accept such a charge? Pause, of about a minute's duration. The answers are slow some accepted. Some know not. Some ask themselves, what is this? In what manner am I approached? Ye would enter the garden with him and watch while he, as thy savior, makes intercession for thee. Wilt thou watch? Ye must answer in thine own heart. Accept, then, that presented here, and arrange same. For thine presentations must, from here, take a turn, for thou that hast made thy purposes, thy desires, thy aims thy lords, are to be honored with his guest, with his presence. Accept ye? Now, ye come to that change that must be wrought in thine experiences, would ye give to this seeking, this waiting world that as thou hast, as a group, been prepared for? What is thy destiny, then? So we give, though in 2034, i.e., 100 years hence, counting from 1934, date of the reading thy lessons, if they are given in his name, will still be living in the hearts and the souls, even, of those that before the throne of grace, will be calling thee by name. Think ye well, then and choose ye. One can imagine the impact of those words upon the group. They packed a wallop. The agonizing choice confronting them raised difficult questions that were to lead eventually to great confusion, conflict, and soul-searching among the group's members before they arrived at their decision. First, if Halaliel had been sent to them through the power of their own desires. Whether conscious or otherwise. Was that good or bad? For each of them knew his or her own spiritual shortcomings, and one or two of them may have trembled. Secondly, if Halaliel was to other worlds what the Christ is to this one, as had been stated had he not his own sheep to tend to? What was he doing in the Christ's domain at this time? Did it bode well or ill? Doubts must have occurred to them on this score. Finally, it had already been made clear to the group, in that reading following Yuvani's flawed advice, that the special work in which they were engaged was the work of the Master of Masters. The current reading now intimated that the results of that work would still be yielding its fruitful returns 100 years hence. In such a case, there appeared to be no need for changing course, thereby involving the intervention of Halaliel or any other questionable guides or gurus. But if he was in truth the Christ's messenger. 
Yes, it might be so. Or it might be that they were simply being tempted and tested. In the event, they opted, with one abstention, to accept no messenger, save in the spirit of the Christ. In later readings, as certain members harked back to that group decision they had only very slowly and hesitantly arrived at, they were not only reminded of Lot's wife, but of Uzzah, who foolishly reached beyond the level of his spiritual understanding. Much time has passed before the correctness of their choice appeared to be confirmed in reading 262.96 on the lesson knowledge, given on May 24, 1936, when no lesson initiate than John the Beloved spoke, apparently chosen by the Master to lead and instruct them as needed in the furtherance of the work. Not instead of thy Master, the Christ, they were told, but as the Beloved of him in the earth that ye may be one in mind, in purpose, that the day of the Lord may draw nigh, 